Let's pray together one more time. Lord, we come to you over and over again in prayer because we believe that we need your help. We need your Holy Spirit now to open our eyes to see what's here. And not just to see it with eyes that know a little bit more about you, but to see it with the kind of eyes that the Holy Spirit would work in such a way as to, to change us, to cause us to worship, to uh, change who we are from the inside out from one degree of glory into the next, into your image. So Lord, would you come through your word and by your spirit and show us in kind of a spectacular text this morning, show us Jesus. We pray it all in his name. Amen. So as I was reading uh, the description of Jesus in Revelation 1 this week, it's a pretty intense description. It's a pretty uh, in-your-face description, trying to imagine myself in some kind of uh, stance or trance and, and looking and seeing this vision. And so I decided, out of curiosity, to type Jesus into Google and look at the most popular pictures of Jesus there. To say, what would most people think of when they think of Jesus? And what I found uh, was a very good-looking guy that could probably be in a lot of shampoo commercials for his long, flowing hair. And I don't know if Jesus had good hair or not for sure, Probably not the hair I saw on Google. Probably didn't have the products we have now. But sometimes we treat Jesus that way. Uh, like he's just a really nice guy who isn't super worried about sin or holiness or his glory and just wants everybody to get along. And I would say that's probably the most popular picture where Jesus is still popular. That, that that's kind of how he meets us. And I'm not here to say that Jesus is not kind. Jesus is kind. He is gentle and lowly in heart towards his own. Jesus is the most kind human being to ever live. But he's not just a human being. <laughs> he's the God man. And so his kindness is deeper. And sometimes we forget that Jesus is quite powerful and fierce and holy. And the picture of Jesus here with, with fire in his eyes and a roaring voice of many waters and white hair and a sword coming out of his mouth and these stacked burnished bronze legs is not what I think he will actually look like in appearance someday when I see him, when you see him, but I think it will be what it feels like to experience him in his presence, and this is who he is now. This is who Jesus is now. And the right response, I think, is exactly what John does. He falls down on his face as though dead. Right? There's these phrases like, I have no strength left in me, and in other places where the glorified Christ shows up, right? The disciples do this in Matthew at the Transfiguration. Isaiah does this in his vision. Daniel does this in his vision. Because this Jesus that shows up in Revelation 1 will judge the world and will bring all his power and all of his presence to bear. So that as we think of the presence of Jesus, it's not immediately a happy, comforting one all alone. It's important to have a comprehensive picture with this part of Jesus as a part of it. Why? Why, why do a people already weary, already worrisome, would this be the vision that God decides to put before them as one of the first words in this book? And I think it's because if we have this vision of Jesus, then when Jesus says, fear not, and you realize he's for you, then you realize that all this fierce, sovereign presence and power is working for you and not against you. In a world where there was a lot of fierce power and fierce presence coming against them, they had this picture of Jesus to say, whoa, <laughs> he's stronger, he's bigger, and he's for us. In other words, we don't find comfort by dumbing down or compartmentalizing the holiness and power of Jesus. 
We find comfort by seeing the power and holiness of Jesus in its full effect, in its full glory, and then falling down in worship as we realize that this is the one who has freed us from our sins by his blood, and he is for us and not against us. This is who we need for us and not against us in a world full of chaos and suffering and restlessness and sometimes persecution. We need to know that this is the Christ of his church and that he will walk with us all the way home to glory. And so John here from Jesus by the Spirit, right, is going to paint this picture for the seven churches to start this letter to basically say, this is your Savior, This is your mighty warrior, and he is for you and not against you. So let's dive in here. Point number one, the context. Read verses 9 to 11 with me. Again, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches. So notice a few things with me as we're still kind of understanding what's happening in this vision. First, notice how John identifies himself, a brother and partner in the tribulation, the kingdom, and the patient endurance that's in Jesus. In the original language, we're meant to take those all together. The tribulation, the kingdom, and the patient endurance in Jesus, like a threefold cord. He's saying here that they are participating in these things together as those who are in Jesus together. A three strand cord that runs throughout the book of Revelation that helps us understand its purpose tribulation, kingdom, and endurance. And that's what he's pointing to. In other words, For those in Jesus, there will always be this threefold cord. All of them are present tense. In other words, John's not looking for some future tribulation. Not that tribulation won't be in the future. It will be in the future, according to him in this book. That's not what he's looking for now. He's saying, I'm partaking in it now. And so to look at the tribulation as if it's only something coming at some time in the future is missing revelation at its very introduction, at the very beginning of what it's trying to tell us. He's experiencing the tribulation now. He's partaking in it. He's fellowshipping in it now. It's not a fun kind of fellowship, but this reminds us when Paul says we want to fellowship in his sufferings. That's what John says he's doing now. And notice he's not looking for some future kingdom. He's living in it now. The kingdom of God is at hand, Jesus said. And he's not looking out a couple thousand years to some future endurance. He's enduring it now. He's in jail. He's in prison enduring this suffering. And at this point in Asia Minor, maybe the reason we struggle to understand it in our context is at this point in Asia Minor, you're receiving this letter, you're hearing about the tribulation and the kingdom and the need for endurance, and you just would have thought, yeah, that's the Christian life. That's the Christian life. Tribulation for this kingdom, a need to endure. And so John is saying, I'm with you in this. And notice Maybe one of the reasons that John has chosen for this vision, you saw up in the beginning that we talked about last week, that the the word of God and the testimony of Jesus, notice that's why he's in prison. That's why it happens. It happens in Jesus and on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. This is significant. John is on this island imprisoned, and the believers he's writing to are suffering and full of weariness and worry because they're in Jesus. They've heard the gospel, they've believed the word of God and the personal work of Jesus, and they've testified to it with their lives and words. And you could go back, and we should go back sometimes. I'll, I'll read some quotes in future weeks, and I got a little bit more time. I think that's a dream of mine with all the symbols that some week I'm going to have more time besides those. But how would they have testified to it? Certainly by sharing the gospel. These believers in the midst of this persecution, there's account after account after account of them sharing the gospel all the way to the point of death in the moment of martyrdom, sharing the truth of the gospel about Jesus Christ, clinging to him. But it wasn't just words. They also did not participate in the worship of false gods. 
They didn't indulge in the immorality of their time. They moved towards love, towards the orphan and the widow and the poor, and did so in the name of Jesus, even when doing so would have landed them pain and persecution. And because of all that, their testimony, their belief, they're clinging to Jesus, they're moving towards this pain, they're abstaining from the cultural norms. Guess what they got? Tribulation over and over again. And why do they do it? Because they believe in the word of God and the testimony of Jesus, that his kingdom is at hand, that they're living in the last days between his first and his second coming, that his kingdom is an eternal kingdom that cannot be shaken. That's what Revelation is going to set up, two kingdoms, kingdom of the dragon and kingdom of the sun. We said it last week. Do you want eternal life forever and some wrath from the dragon now? Or do you want some life now in the presence of the dragon and eternal wrath from the lamb? That's the, the kingdom war that's going on here. And he's saying, we're in the kingdom of God. That's why we do what we do. That's why we say what we say. That's why we abstain from what we abstain from. That's why we engage in what we engage in. In other words, they know that his kingdom is an eternal kingdom that cannot be shaken. And so they know that the sufferings of this present life are worth it for eternity with Jesus. They're looking to an eternal home with fullness of joy in the presence of Jesus versus temporary comfort in an earthly place. And so in those contexts, tribulation, kingdom, what do they need? What do you need in tribulation, knowing the kingdom of God is real and true? Don't you need endurance? Or don't you need endurance? Aren't there times where it would just be easier to give up, easier to give in? Right? Easier just to not be looked at funny and different and, and weird. Easier to not have the world say that you look weak and foolish like in Corinthians. Right? Easier just to go, man, that sin feels good. I'm just going to engage you. It would just be easier. So what do they need? What do we need? Endurance. Why? Because Jesus is too real to abandon. <laughs> Because resurrection life with him is better than anything this world can offer. And we know that in our best moments. They can't walk away. They can't be apathetic. To believe in him and testify to the kingdom will continue to bring tribulation. And so they need to endure. And so John writes this from Jesus as an encouragement and as a fellow endurer in the tribulations in front of them. South cities, there will be tribulation. Jesus promised it there will be tribulation the world does not think Jesus is cool or worth it indeed he's becoming less and less in style but we believe his kingdom is at hand we believe he's here and with us we believe his word and we have to keep testifying to it so that others can be transferred from the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of his beloved son so let's ask ourselves are we testifying but are we, are we testifying? We do not have the, the threat of persecution that they had. And I would just say to you, someone asked me this question once, and I think it's a good one. If right now, everyone that you've been actively sharing the gospel with, if God said, I will right now save them from their sins, if you've been telling them about Jesus, how many people would it be? How, how, many, how many people are we testifying to the good news of Jesus about? And that's not a guilt trip, right? That's an invitation. There's two kingdoms. We want them to come in. And the reason that these people are choosing persecution is because they're opening their mouths <laughs> to talk about Jesus. Do you believe the gospel? Do you love it? Do you treasure it? Is it the best news in the world to you? Is it what you love most? Are you growing in holiness in humility and hope. As suffering and sorrow comes, this letter doesn't just help us kind of stand back and go, Jesus, protect us. It calls us into action, obedience, to testify, to believe, to treasure, to keep testifying, keep believing, keep treasuring. And if we do that, as suffering and sorrow comes, this letter helps us to endure. Kids, have you ever read a book or seen a movie where the characters have to do something really, really, really hard. And it looks like they might not win, but in the end it's for something really, really good. Well, those stories are all echoes of this story. Trusting Jesus will sometimes be very hard, but Jesus is very good, and he's very worth it. 
Last thing we want to notice here is that notice John hears something and is told to write down what he sees. And we'll keep seeing these two elements in Revelation, hearing and seeing and then writing down. He's out in the Lord's Day, a day commemorating the resurrection of Jesus, which is appropriate because he's going to see the risen Christ. It says here he's in the Spirit, and I take that to mean led or filled with the Spirit for the task at hand. And the task at hand is being commissioned by King Jesus with a loud voice like a trumpet to write down everything that he's about to see. To write it down, to encourage those who trust in Jesus are a part of his kingdom and must endure tribulation. Now the trumpet would have been heard from these Old Testament readers who had the Old Testament as their main Bible as a sign of a word of judgment and salvation at the same time, right? You can think of various examples of this. Think of Jericho, right? Think of those as an example. Here's the trumpets. They're blowing salvation for some, judgment for others. And this trumpet voice, this voice of judgment and salvation tells John, write this down for the sake of the seven churches. And that voice is Jesus. And Jesus confirms again this calling in verse 19. So Jesus gives John the job to record this vision for the endurance of the saints in his kingdom in the midst of tribulation. High calling that John's receiving here. And now we get to find out who he's writing to. So let's look at the churches. This point will be short, but I want to notice a few things about these churches. Look at verses 11 and 12 and then verse 20 with me. Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira Thyatira, and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. And then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. Verse 20, as for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, And the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So we go back in history and we can identify these churches. These are real churches in Asia Minor. In fact, if you started at the island of Patmos and you kind of circled your way around, you could kind of go in that order. He's kind of drawing a circle around where he is. And Patmos was an island that was a little ways off the coast of Ephesus. And so we'll see in all these real churches with real historical things going on, and then we'll see their faithfulness, we'll see their foolishness, and we'll see the unique call each of them has to endure in Jesus. However... And almost all commentators agree on this. The number seven in Revelation is also a sign of completeness or wholeness, signifying that the message to these real churches in real time is also a message for the whole church throughout time. In other words, there's nothing Jesus will call one church to or call another church away from that he wouldn't also call another church to or away from. Does that make sense? It's not like he's got special rules for special churches. He wants faithfulness for all of us. And once we get to the letters to the churches, although each one is addressed to a specific church, at the end of each message, it's said to be to the churches, plural, confirming the universal nature of the instruction. In other words, all churches will be tempted to compromise and corruption, to weariness and worry, tribulation and trial, all need to endure. And so this is a universal message being taken from real life churches in real history. And the stars represent angels. We'll talk more about them coming up in the letters. But I think these are real angelic beings that show the the heavenly nature of the church and the heavenly care for the church. And one of the things Revelation is going to challenge us on and has been challenging our little reading group on as we read through it is just this whole realm of angels and demonic forces. We're going to talk a lot about it as we walk through Revelation, but for right now I'm just playing my cards and saying I think these are angels. Angels, real angels for real churches showing the heavenly nature and heavenly care for the church. And then the picture of the seven lampstands, it is nice in Revelation when they just tell you exactly what they mean, right? You don't have to go looking somewhere in the Old Testament. But when they tell you, and here we have it, right? We talked last week, these seven lampstands are probably taken from Zechariah and they represent the church. Lampstands were found in the tabernacle and the temple where the Lord dwells. The spirit is seen as inhabiting and empowering the lampstands in the temple. And therefore the church here is really being pictured as the new temple, the new place 
where God dwells with his people. And I think it's just significant, and we should just pause and wonder that we have the kind of God, the kind of risen Christ who dwells in the midst of his church. Isn't that amazing? He dwells in the midst of his church. He's he's here right now with us by the spirit. Jesus dwells with his churches. He wants to be near his church. He's not far off, not unengaged. He's with his church in the midst of the churches. He wants to be with his people. He wants to be with South City's church. He wants to exhort us and encourage us. He wants to comfort and convict us. He wants to meet us with his presence and power. He wants to help us live in his kingdom and endure when trials come. Jesus loves his church. He dies for her. He lives for her. He intercedes for her. He is with her. He won't let her coast or become apathetic. He won't let her run to other things. Jesus loves us and will do whatever it takes to walk with us through tribulation, no matter what beastly or dragon-like things come our way until we get all the way home. Lastly, what you've all been waiting for, the Christ, right? This vision. So let's look with John at this vision of the Christ who's standing in the midst of his churches to help them through tribulation. Look at verse 13. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The long robe with the golden sash would have immediately made readers of the Old Testament think of the office of priest. So what is Jesus doing in the midst of his churches? Here is Jesus ministering to the church as the perfect high priest who can make sacrifice for sins, has made that sacrifice and will now work to apply that to us. He has made a way to God and he will care for us to get us all the way home. So we're meant to see right away, Jesus is the perfect high priest. He's gonna be with his people and minister to his people in this holy place, the church. Verse 14a continues, the hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. And I want to make the argument that if verse 13 is saying Jesus is the perfect high priest, verse 14 is meant to say Jesus is the king. He's the king and he's the priest. Why do I say that? Well, here Jesus is standing in the midst of the church to encourage, exhort, help us endure. And John says it's one like a son of man. And this certainly would have taken original readers back to Daniel 7, one of the most famous passages they went to. And in Daniel 7, there's this figure, most agree it's God the Father, the Ancient of Days, he's called there. He's clearly the one with all authority because all the thrones are set up around him. And his throne is in the middle with everyone looking to him like, hey, you're in charge here. It's called the Ancient of Days. And later in the chapter, one like a son of man comes and is given all the authority and the power of the Ancient of Days forever. So here's the ancient of days, all authority, ruling over all things. Here comes one like a son of man, and the ancient of days says, I'm giving you all my authority, giving you all my power. You have all the dominion. All the nations will bow before you. And listen to how the ancient of days is described in Daniel 7, verse 9. His clothing was white as snow, and his hair like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, and its wheels were burning fire. So here, in Revelation 1, the Son of Man is described just like the Ancient of Days. Showing here, even in the book of Revelation, I think, for all readers who knew the Old Testament, Jesus is God. He's God. Right, the Son of Man from Daniel 7 not only was given dominion by the Ancient of Days, but he is one with the Ancient of Days. This is our triune God. Right? Jesus said, all authority has been given to me. Right? And that's what this is picturing. Here he is. Wait, he's the Son of Man, but he sounds like the Ancient of Days. And the readers are going, oh, he's God. Right? The three in one God. In fact, this description also matches a heavenly figure in Daniel 10, verses 5 to 6. Where there Daniel has a vision and falls on his face like he's dead. And I think the beginning of Daniel 10, Daniel sees the pre-incarnate Christ falls on his face. Then an angel shows up and talks to him. So what do these things 
represent, as the people would have heard it, well, certainly complete power, <laughs> complete dominion. Here's the ancient of days in the person of Jesus Christ. The white hair likely represents the complete wisdom of the one who never had a beginning and never has an end, the alpha and the omega. The eyes of fire represent his burning gaze that sees all and knows all, right? So if you're thinking, man, there's just so many things that are out there that, that people don't know about, so many injustices, so much pain, so many things, Jesus sees it all. <laughs> he knows all. He has complete omniscience, so complete wisdom, complete omniscient, complete power. Verse 15, his feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace and his voice was like the roar of many waters. Again, Old Testament pictures, the burnished bronze right from Daniel 10, the roar of many waters from Ezekiel 43 where the presence of the Lord was coming and they could hear it far off because it's so loud. The burnished bronze here shows his purity, his steadfastness, his sturdiness, his power that has been tested and tried and stands and remains from eternity past into the present. His voice shows his word goes forth and brings his presence to bear in judgment and salvation. He's got complete sovereignty and he's got the ability with his word to affect whatever he needs to affect whenever he wants to affect it. Verse 16 In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. Where do these images come from? You guessed it, the Old Testament. right? The two-edged sword is from Isaiah 49. It's a picture of the Messiah coming to save his people and showing the piercing, penetrating nature of his word to bring judgment and salvation. It's showing him as a mighty warrior with his weapon as the sword, his words as the weapon to condemn and to save. And then the picture of the shining of his face in full strength is a picture from Judges 5 of the mighty victorious warrior of God's people showing Jesus as the ultimate victorious warrior over all who oppose his people. So here's how I would sum up what this vision is supposed to show us. And what I think, in all honesty, that the original readers would have gone, yeah, we know all the stories. <laughs> We've heard all those stories. We're getting what you're saying about Jesus. Is that so far we have a priestly and kingly ministry to his church with complete wisdom, complete omniscience, Complete steadfast power to stomp on his enemies by the power of his perfect, penetrating, mighty word as the victorious warrior of his people. That's what I think John is seeing. And I would just say, and I think you'd agree with me, this is someone we want on our side. <laughs> right? you, you want this guy on your team when you see him. He has complete wisdom where we don't know what to do. Anyone in here ever feel confused about what to do? He has complete wisdom. Anyone else know that you have areas of foolishness left in your life? He has complete wisdom. Right? He has complete omniscience to make up for all the things we don't know and can't predict. Don't we spend so much of our lives like, I just don't have enough information. <laughs> I just don't know what's coming. I just don't know how to make this decision with all that I have. And he would just say, trust me, I know everything. Take, take the next step. I know it all and I'm on your side. But he has complete power to meet us in our finite weakness and suffering when we feel shaken and like we're going back and forth and we're about to tumble. His burnished bronze feet, <laughs> tested through the fiery furnace, tested and seen to be faithful and good and lasting and true, he stands for us. He says, hold on to me, right? Just, just get under the shadow of my wings. I'm going to take care of you. His word will come forth to pierce and to penetrate, to convict and comfort his people in great love, to conform us to the image of Christ, to reorient us to what's most true and most good and most beautiful. Like if you're comfortable in your sin, you won't be for long if you belong to him. 
And if you feel weary and completely hopeless, you won't be for long if you belong to him. His word's going to come and comfort and convict and conform and reorient and show us what's good and right and true and beautiful. And he's going to get us to glory forever. He is the victorious warrior. He wins every time. And as he sees this vision and these things are coming, the people that have been hearing, going, we want him on our side. This, then he speaks, right? John has fallen down before him like he's dead, right? He doesn't have any strength left. He doesn't know what to do. This is an overwhelming vision. And what does this victorious priest, king, warrior say? What are his first words? Fear not. Like how? When he tells us how, right? I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I'm alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and Hades. When we see this vision, it should cause holy trembling. Yet here, like in Daniel, like in Matthew at the transfiguration, God tells his people, don't fear. Two reasons, I think, why. One, because he's a mighty warrior who is so much bigger and stronger and will last so much longer than Rome or anyone that will ever try to extinguish God's people. How many empires have risen and fallen and they have just gone and said, our goal is to stomp out Christianity. Where are they? They're not here, right? But Jesus is still here. The church is still here. And it's not because the church is really strong or really smart on its own. It's because Jesus reigns because this picture is true. (laughs) This is who he is. This is what he does for his people. And we know he's for us because he's died. He's paid for our sins. And he rose again to conquer death so that for all who would believe, he opens the gates of death and Hades so that they would no longer hold the people of God. He looks at death and Hades and says, I'm in charge of that too. I own that too. I died and I rose again and I own that too. When I say all authority, I mean all authority, all authority over life. All authority over death, it all belongs to me. And I'm for you, and I have the keys, and when you go there, I'm going to open it up, and you're not going to stay there. Jesus said in John 11 that all who believe in him would never really die. And it's true, and it's our great hope. We're just saying, because he lives, right? We can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fears are gone. All those Old Testament pictures were pointing towards a Messiah who would come and save his people. And they all came to bear in the person and work of Jesus. Daniel sees a vision like this and he's told, hey, shut that up. Don't write that down. Don't pass that on. John gets his vision and he's told, write these things down. In other words, I think what was going on in Daniel, was shut up for a time, is now being fulfilled. <laughs> so what's going on here. And what does Jesus want us to see? I'm for you. I'm a mighty warrior for my church. I came and I died for your sins. I freed you from your sins by my blood. I love you. I rose again to conquer death. So you are free of condemnation. You're free of fear of death. I'm a mighty warrior. I'm still here doing my priestly, kingly duty. Church, I'm here. I'm for you. Don't fear because I'm here and for you. Do you believe that that's enough? Do you believe that's what matters most? Do you believe this vision of his fierceness and his power is now completely aimed for your good if you're in Christ? That's what John wants us to see. That Jesus is God, the God-man, Emmanuel, come to live the life we couldn't live, die the death we deserve to die, and raised again to conquer death. He has all the wisdom, all the power, all the sturdy sovereignty, all the piercing word, a victorious warrior through his death for sins and resurrection over death. He holds the keys to all things. And that one lives in the midst of his people to continue to be our high priest, our sovereign king, ever making intercession for us and always working on our behalf. Amazing transcendence. Amazing imminence. Right? Only our God, only the Christian God, do those things come together in that way. And how will we conquer? 
Right? How are we conquer? What's the, the message? Remember the, the threefold strand. We'll join him in tribulation. It's not necessarily the most fun message right, we've ever heard, but it's the message. We're going to join him in tribulation. We're going to share in his sufferings. We're going to take up our cross and follow him. How will we conquer? We'll, we'll live knowing his kingdom is everlasting. How will we conquer? We'll endure in his strength. How will we conquer? Well, when we're confused and life feels chaotic, we'll look to this risen Christ for wisdom. How will we conquer when we don't have enough information to know about tomorrow? We'll look to his sovereign omniscience and we'll trust him. How will we conquer when we're weak and beat up and struggling? We will look at his sturdy sovereignty and trust him to hold on to us and we can't hold on to ourselves. How will we conquer Right? When we're weary in trials and suffering in the struggle of this world, we will let his word comfort us. How will we conquer when we're stuck in sin? We will let his word pierce us and change us and transform us and submit to him. How will we conquer when it feels like the world is going crazy and there's only loss and evil winning everywhere? We will look to this risen Christ as the mighty, victorious warrior whose face shines like the sun pouring light on things in full strength and whose eyes see all things will make all things right. How will the church conquer? By looking only to Jesus for comfort, hope, conviction, joy, strength, and endurance. How it's always conquered. <laughs> How it always will conquer. Church, there will be trials. His kingdom will Endure. We will endure suffering into eternal glory by the strength of our risen King. He has died. He is alive. He holds the keys. He has freed us from our sins by his blood. He has conquered through death and resurrection. In this world, we will have trouble. Fear not, South City's Church. Take heart. He has overcome and he will overcome the world. Let me pray. So Lord, what a beautiful mystery it is that now we get to come and eat and drink with that mighty warrior we just saw. And that you, you've prepared this meal for us week after week to give us the privilege to come into your presence, to fellowship with you, to, to remember who you are and remember what you've done. And Lord, I just pray that by your spirit, the reality of who you are for your church would sink in deep, would fill us with greater measures of humility and courage, would fill, fill us with greater measures of hope and endurance, would cause anxiety and fear and foolishness to flee would give us greater strength to get up and again fight the fight against sin, would give us encouragement again to testify to your goodness and beauty in the gospel to our friends and coworkers and neighbors and even to the ends of the earth. Lord, would give us strength to just keep enduring and not become apathetic or too weary and just give in to the things around us or the things inside of us that we know don't please you. So, Lord, comfort your church by who you are. Purify your church by who you are. Encourage your church by who you are. Lord, engage your church. Lord, stand in the midst of this church right now. Make this eating and drinking a holy moment. Our standing with you in your midst as you stand with us, Lord, give us what we need. You know every heart in this room, Lord. So as we come to eat and drink with you, Help us see who you are, and Lord, help, help it have its full effect in whatever area it needs to in every heart. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.